the experience as a commanding officer in a squadron, fleet squadron, benefits you when you get to the blues. The, the flying is pretty much the same, except you do it with more than one airplane, or you do it upside down, or you do it a lot closer to the ground than you do in the fleet. It's the show business that's the different part of it. As soon as I knew what, uh, uh, what an airplane was, you know, I was smitten by them. Grew up in, a, in an Air Force town, Shreveport, Louisiana, across the river from Barksdale Air Force Base. And I'm, I'm uh, old enough to remember World War II and, uh, and the various airplanes that they had there, except that I remember at one point in my life saying, I think the, the most difficult thing to do would be to land an airplane on, on a carrier, and I think that's what I'd like to do. And that's how I ended up in naval aviation. I wanted to go to the Naval Academy, so I aimed everything I did in school and prepare, to prepare primarily academically and physically to go to the Naval Academy, and, and I was accepted and went to the Naval Academy in 1956, graduated in 1960. Well, I, went directly to uh, Navy flight training in Pensacola. I, you know, I could hardly wait to get there and uh, finished up after six months and then went to Kingsville, Texas for uh, advanced. Finished up training there and wanted to be an attack pilot and we were on our way to California living the dream and spent a lot of time out there in the light attack business made two cruises in the A-4 in the early 60s, and my second cruise was my first combat cruise. The, the balloon went up in Vietnam in 1965 for us. One day we were at sea, flight ops were, had been stood down, and the general alarm went off on the ship. And they said, well, tomorrow we're going to war. And uh, then they said, Go back to your stateroom, get a good night's sleep. Well, nobody did. That was the first combat cruise for me. And then as we came back from that cruise, it was my time to rotate to shore duty. I ended up going to the Naval Postgraduate School in the Aero Engineering Program. As I came out of, uh, out of Monterey, where I got an Aero Engineering degree, the war was still somewhat in its infancy, and the Bureau of Personnel said, nobody goes two times before everybody goes once. And so, as it turned out, it was, it was very uh, beneficial for me personally because I ended up going to be an instructor in the A-7 RAG and spent three years flying the A-7 as an instructor so that when I did go back on sea duty again, in an A-7 squadron. I was a mid-grade lieutenant commander and very comfortable in the airplane. Uh, that part of my naval career to me was the most enjoyable part, not necessarily the, because it was, in a, it was combat, but because I was very comfortable and experienced in the airplane. And I got selected for a program called the uh, Bobby Sox program. It was, uh, it was a, an Admiral Zumwalt program that, uh, chose, that chose to put officers into command assignments one grade junior to the, what the table of organization would call for. And so they took a selected group of lieutenant commanders and made them commanding officers. And uh, so I was chosen for that, I rolled out of a combat deployment so that I could go right back to sea duty as a commanding officer. And uh, in the interim, the war ended in 1972 and I, got, uh, I took command of a, an A-7 squadron in 74. And I was still a lieutenant commander when I came out of my assignment, uh, command assignment. And, uh, and I was having a hard time finding a job. I, I, I even applied for a non-flying job on a ship 
uh, and and th the answer that would come back was, you're too junior, Casey, for that job. Well, the, the, the detailer at the Bureau of Personnel that I was dealing with, whom I knew personally from another squadron assignment, suggested or ask if I had ever considered the Blue Angels. And I said, no, I never have, and I'm really not interested in doing that. And so every so often, when I would talk to him on the phone about assignments for other officers, he'd bring up the, the idea of the Blue Angels. Well, finally I said to, to this guy, I said, Paul, you know my wife, Janice. I'm going to go home tonight and tell her I have found a job that I might fit into and it'll be the leader of the Blue Angels. And I said, she is going to go through the ceiling when I tell her this and uh, I'll come back and call you tomorrow and, and tell you what happened. So I, all the way home, I can, I can still remember this, you know, driving home that evening, laughing to myself and I walked in the door and I said, honey. I, I think I've found a job that I might be able to do. And she said, what's that? I said, leader of the Blue Angels. And then I just kind of stood back waiting for her reaction. And she didn't say anything for a while. And she said, that sounds like a pretty good job. <laughs> and that was it. Uh, you know, I applied and uh, went down there. And after a while, I, I told her, I said, looks like this could happen. So if you're just pulling my leg here, you better speak up now. And, and uh, it all came to pass. I, I can recall in the beginning, and of course, the boss is a new guy just like everyone else, or uh, like half the team. Half the team rotates out and the new half come in and they're trained by their predecessors as, as you're going through winter training, and the boss gets trained just like everybody else. And, and uh, it, it, it was not a hard adjustment to me to go from being a commanding officer of a fleet squadron to being a newbie. Uh, I've, I've just been in the business long enough to know that every new assignment in the Navy, it's gonna be new for you. And, uh, but this was, quite a bit different. I can also remember thinking, just like I had done uh, as I'm getting ready for carrier qualifications, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is hard stuff, especially at night. But everybody who's gone before me has done it, so I can do it. And the same thing was true in my thinking of, of, the, uh, of the Blue Angel technique. You know, I, there have been a lot of other guys who put their pants on just like I do and that have done this. And while it's hard, yeah, but I can do it. First air show was at El Centro. So uh, first air show was not uh, particularly uh, difficult because we had been working there before. The next air show was at Yuma and that was not far away. When we finished the, the, the two air shows in the Imperial Valley there at uh, El Centro and at Yuma, then we went back to Pensacola and we began the, the next routine. And it was also the 30th anniversary of the Blue Angels. We try to make every show site the same as the one before and the one after. The only thing that changes is the terrain underneath you and, and you strive very hard to replicate every show and make it exactly the same. So the, the various show sites don't stick in your, your memory that, that well, unless it's something unusual like the uh, anniversary show in July at 1976 in Philadelphia. And the, the big thing I recall about that was that the, the uh, snowbirds were there also for the, for the show. That year went smoothly, and uh, I'm happy to say, uh, as a newbie boss, it was, it was good that we didn't have any bumps in the road. 
77 was a different story. The big event for 77 occurred in winter training when we lost our, our prospective number six pilot. It was Niall Kraft. Uh, he and I had served together in VA 192. He followed me to the Blue Angels. He even said, you know, boss, I'm, I want to, because you're going there, I think I, I want to go there. He was our narrator for 76. A, a wonderful uh, personality. He was kind of the personality of the team. On that particular day, it was a, it was a windy day. Uh, John Miller, the number five pilot, had come here to Dallas to evaluate a show site, so Niall was out practicing by himself. Because it was a windy day, we didn't have a video crew in the in the uh, in the area uh, videoing the practice. And apparently, uh, practicing the uh, low transition from uh, takeoff and half cubinate to a low exit, uh, he flew into the ground. And we. Uh, only learned about it when the California Highway Patrol called us and told us that a train engineer had seen the accident. So there we were, um, three weeks away from the start of the season and we had lost our, our number six pilot. And uh, we, we stood down for a day, but we flew the next day. So that was on the 22nd of February. We flew until the 26th of February, and then we took two days off, went back to Arlington to bury Nile, and we came back and started flying again on the 1st of March. And on the 18th of March, we flew our air show with six airplanes. We recalled Vance Parker from the 75 team and he had only been away from the business for one year. He was flying F-14s at the time. The fact that we were you know, so depressed uh, with the accident and three, three weeks later we made the first show, it, we started this roller coaster and, of emotions. And, and so we were on a, on a roll, if you will, on the 18th of March when we were flying an air show with six airplanes and six pilots. Unfortunately, at an, the air show in uh, El Toro, uh, there's a maneuver that the solos were doing back then. I don't, they don't do it now in the F-18. It's called the uh, clean loop, dirty loop. And, and both solo aircraft meet at the start of the maneuver, one is high speed and the other is slow with gear and flaps down and they fly matching circles or matching loops around. Unfortunately, the opposing solo touched down at the bottom of his loop, but he had his gear and flaps down and he was over the runway. However, it was a pretty hard landing and pretty spectacular to watch the smoke trail uh, as he touched down. So we flew it back to Pensacola. We got another airplane. Uh, we dodged a, a, a real close bullet. So we were on the high again. And, uh, and the rest of that summer went fairly smoothly. The A-4 was a, 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 an amazing airplane to maintain. But it still required people who who knew their job. I, I had two great maintenance officers, Mike Dieter and Jack Johnson. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're only two people. Uh, typically, I think we had about 150 to maybe 100, I think it was about 150 maintainers. Everyone who travels with the team, every maintainer who travels with the team is dual qualified. They may be an electrician, but they are trained on engine maintenance, or they may be a, 
uh, parachute rigger and, and they're going to be qualified on the uh, pressurization system in the airplane. It's, uh, it's, it's terrific to work with people that one are more motivated to do the job than you are. I mean, we get, we're the ones that get the pleasure of flying the airplanes, but uh, I, I'm sure they get pleasure seeing those beautiful airplanes go every time. And in the two years I was there, as the boss, we never flew a show without six airplanes. And it almost got boring for the maintenance officer to say, boss, you got six go airplanes today, but it, you just expected it. The Thunderbirds, back then, and, and I think to this day, when they taxi out of their, uh, out of the chocks, they give this rig, a big dramatic thumbs up to their crew chief and and we always thought that was pretty hokey well we were sitting at our in our hangar there in Pensacola and this we hear this roar and whoosh and look out the window and the Thunderbirds had just put a hit on our hangar and about the same time the phone rang and it was the tower calling us saying hey the Thunderbirds just flew over and they're on their way to Hurlbut Field which is within easy driving distance of where we are and uh, in Pensacola. So we all jumped in our cars and drove over to Hurlbut Field to huddle with them. And, and in fact, we had an impromptu reunion th th those days. But anyway, their photographer wanted to get a picture of both teams together. So in that we were on their turf, the uh, Thunderbirds knelt down in front of us and we all stood behind them and then as they were getting ready to take the picture we all go and give our a big uh, grin thumbs up. To this day I've got a copy of that and every time I meet a Thunderbird and exchange emails with I send them that picture. You know, we strive for perfection, I think, was one of the slogans that was in the, uh, in the hangar. I don't know if it's there anymore. But we know we're never going to get there. Uh, but everyone is focused on that goal. And, and the interesting thing about the Blue Angels is that uh, everyone can be critiqued for a mistake. And, and it's easy for the boss to be critiqued because he's got, always he's got at least three people behind him watching what he does. I, as the boss, never see what they do. I turn my mirrors out because I don't want to be distracted by any movement that, that they make. So we all want to fly the perfect air show, but we know we're never going to get there. But, there are times when you, when it's all over, you never come back and say, no, nothing to debrief. You always have something to debrief. But sometimes you, you come pretty close to what you thought was the perfect air show. It, it, you know, these are um, tremendous memories for me. And, and every now and then, something will trigger another one that was locked away deeply in my my psyche and uh, and it's for the most part it's it's a good memory when it come when it pops up i i do it all over again and i'm it means my navy time i had 29 years in the navy and uh, i wouldn't change much if anything because it was a, a wonderful period <laughs>